Okay, thanks for inviting me and thanks for coming and uh, thanks to you for this very nice introduction to non malib extractors and saved me a lot of time uh, talking about backgrounds. Uh, so, by the way, this is a joint work with Zhishen, who is, uh, has just recently graduated from UT Austin and uh, is going to join IAS shortly. Uh, okay, so then uh, I'm going to start with this more cryptography problem, uh, privacy amplification, which was first introduced by uh, Bernard Brassad and Robert in a 1985 paper. So we're again, so we have this, we have seen Alice and Bob many times, uh, so we're going to see him, uh, see them again in this talk. So I have Alice Bob, where they have this communication channel, and there's uh, adversary Eve here who is watching this channel. And the go, uh, so the, these two parties also have a shared weekly random string, which is just a weak random source, uh, as you have just seen. And then the goal is to try to communicate uh, between the channels, and then eventually the two parties will end up with private and uniform random uh, strings. And from that, they could do like all of these kind of cryptography tasks, like one-time pad and these kind of things. And for this problem, we also assume that these two parties have local uh, uniform random bits, but those are not shared. And the big question is how to get the shared weak random uh, secrets into shared and uniform private random strings. Uh, and in this talk, uh, uh, we're going to assume that the diversity has unlimited computational power. So this is purely information theoretic setting. And this is a very useful tool, as you have seen in Gio's talk, is this kind of seeded extractor, where you use a seed to extract from a weak random source and uh, outputs uniform distribution. And given that, the problem of privacy amplification, if the adversary is passive, is actually quite easy to solve, because uh, what we can do is we can just have Alice pick a random seed and send it to Bob, and then they both uh, output the output of the extractor. And because we know that the output of the extractor is uniform even if the adversary receives the seed, why? So that means it's going to be still uh, private <coughs> to the adversary, and they have obtained this shared uniform random bits, which is pretty cool. Uh, nice application of seeded extractors. <coughs> but in this, uh, in, this, in this talk, we're going to consider a um, more powerful adversary where uh, it's not going to be passive but it's going to be active in the sense it can actually like, change the messages sent between the channels or even insert and delete or even maybe run several rounds with one party before it runs the protocol with the other party. And then of course the original protocol um, of using this city extractor of one round protocol fails because the adversary can simply change the seed and then the two parties will end up with two different strings so that's not the goal of the protocol. And before we move into the products, I just want to say what, uh, what's the goal of this privacy application when there is an active adversary, right? Because, of course, if the adversary like, does arbitrarily, then you cannot hope to like, get anything. So basically, what we want here is uh, uh, both parties can output a string or a special symbol indicating that, that they're going to reject. And we want several properties of this protocol. So if, first of all, if the adversary is actually passive, then the protocol should succeed with property one, and then the, the both parties will end up with a private shared uniform random string. And if uh, the adversary is actually active, then we want to say that uh, um, the property that the adversary calls the protocol to fail is, is quite a small bounded by epsilon. And uh, uh, we define that by the adversary can cause the two parties to output two different strings and not rejecting. So in this case, the adversary wins. So we want to bound that probability to be small. And the final uh, property we want, a simplified version is you can think if one party does not reject, then uh, his output should be close to uniform, even in the adversary's view. Because that's not quite the formal definition, but it's a simplified version here. And there are two important parameters here. So first of all, we want the output to be as large as possible. And so the entropy minus the output is the entropy loss. And so this uh, log one of epsilon, where epsilon is the error, is called the security parameter, as you have the protocol. Okay. And there has been a lot of works on uh, this problem, privacy application with uh, active adversary. <coughs>
So early works can do one run protocol, but it requires the entropy to be pretty large. And then uh, uh, there are subsequent works which can use uh, multi-run protocols. So for example, two run protocols. But then the entropy loss is like uh, S squared. Um, but, but as you can see, the optimal protocol should be like using two runs and uh, with entropy loss, something like uh, all of S, where S is a security parameter. Um, but um, so pr until pretty recently, most of uh, all of these constructions, they have to at least use two runs protocols or incur very large um, entropy loss, at least for when the entropy is pretty small here. And uh, then uh, there's this work by Dolis and Wicks who introduced this non malleable extract and gives a very nice protocol using uh, non malleable extractors. So I'm just going to briefly describe this protocol as you have seen the definitions of non malleable extractors. Uh, so we're going to use a simple um, primitive here, which I'm sure many of you have already known is the message authentication code. Uh, so this is something where assuming you have two parties with shared randomness, then Alice can use this shared randomness to authenticate some message Y to Bob. Um, but when the way to do is to also send a tag using uh, this message authentication code. And if the adversary, if it wants to change the message Y to Y prime, then he has also to change the tag T to T prime, and he wants wants to make sure that T prime is a correct tag for Y prime, because otherwise Bob will detect and reject. And the, if we have this shared randomness, then uh, actually it can guarantee that the probability that uh, Eve can change the message and also forge this tag is pretty small. It's bounded by some epsilon here. Okay. And the given this thing, uh, there's a very nice two-round protocol privacy amplification using non malleable extractors. So this is also in the work by Dodders and Wicks. So again, so in the first round, we, uh, we're going to try to repeat the original one run protocol. And it sends some string to Bob. Except now, instead of applying a regular strong city extractor, they're going to apply this non malleable extractor. <coughs> and then we're going to use the second round, where Bob is trying to send another uh, random string from his own local randomness, W prime, to Alice. Except now, it's going, he's going to use this R prime and the message authentication code to authenticate this message. And then Alice, when he receives this, it just first check if the Mac matches. If it doesn't match, then she rejects. If it does not, if it does not reject, then they both use uh, a standard extractor and uh, use W and W prime as a seed to extract from the source. <coughs> And the analysis actually is pretty straightforward. You're just uh, considering two cases, right? So if in the first round, uh, the adversary does not change the seed Y, then basically you get R and R prime are the same. And in the second round, you can just use a Mac to authenticate W prime to Alice. But if in the first round, uh, the adversary actually changes the seed, then uh, the non multiple extractor says that uh, this uh, R is going to be uniformly independent of our prime. So the, in the second round, the message sent by Bob is actually going to, uh, is going to leak no information about this R to the adversary. So then the adversary, even if he sees the message, there's no way he can come up with the correct tag for, for Alice because he knows nothing about R. And then in this case, Alice will reject it. So that's very simple and uh, elegant protocol. And of course, now the big question is, uh, uh, OK, like Drew had mentioned. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that's how we analyze it. So the big question is, how do we construct these number of extractors? And uh, as you have seen, previous constructions, uh, there's many constructions, but essentially all of them require uh, the entropy to be at least log n over epsilon squared, uh, at least when this k entropy is small. And if you translate it, into the protocol, it means that the security parameter is at uh, most, you can achieve is at most square root of k. Uh, but essentially, we want to achieve any um, security parameter up to, let's say, omega k. OK. Um, and uh, so, so in this work, our results is that we have the first explicit number of extractor, which improves this 
log n over epsilon square thing, we get, uh, we get it down to log n over epsilon to 1 plus theta over 1. And of course, if you plug this number of extractor into this private amplification protocol, so it gives you uh, um, the first explicit optimal privacy amplification protocols for almost all security parameters, let's say up to k to the 1 minus any little constant. And, and also independent of our work, uh, Geo also has this new construction which uh, has better dependence in the log n part, uh, but the same <coughs> dependence on the error part here. And so I should just mention that this log little o one thing is just something like 2 to the order of the square root of log log. All right, so uh, in the remaining time, so how much time do I have? Nine minutes. Okay. So just briefly mention the techniques used. Uh, of course, you have seen some of the techniques in Joe's talk. Um, so again, so we are uh, giving a weak source X, and we have a seed Y. So as you, if we want to construct a non-value extractor, then there's a, another seed Y prime, which is like, you can think of it like uh, any function of Y, but uh, with no fixed points. <coughs> So the first step, we're going to use this seed y and the source to create a matrix here, uh, which um, I think you already see is, uh, in Gio's talk, is, is a matrix that has all of log and over epsilon rows. And for this step, we can actually just use all of log and over epsilon random base to achieve this. <coughs> so of course, we get two matrices for, uh, for different y and y prime. And so we just take a closer look at these two matrices. So what properties do they have? So first of all, uh, they could be correlated because uh, uh, the seed might be correlated. And so they could be correlated, uh, but there's an important property that uh, there exists one row in this Z matrix. Uh, actually, so first of all, every row of this Z matrix is, is going to be uniform. But again, they may be correlated. And the second more important property is that there exists one row in this matrix Z, which is uniform even given the corresponding row in this matrix Z prime, which is exactly what you have just seen in Gio's talk. <coughs> and now we're going to uh, take, uh, let's say, uh, another part of the seed and apply something uh, to get the output. And uh, correspondingly, you also get uh, some output V prime for this matrix Z prime. And this is exactly is the, once we do this, the output of V is going to be guaranteed to be uniform given the output of V prime. And this is exactly the independence preserving merger that Joe has talked just now. And our merger is, is actually, uh, yeah, of course, uh, inspired by um, the work by uh, Joanne Sherman. And uh, so we have some slight modifications here. Okay, so let's uh, try to get some ideas, high-level ideas on how we construct this merger. So first simple observation is that, let's say you take to take a source Z and the seed W and apply a regular seeded extractor to output a V here. And then you take a correlated Z prime and W prime, you apply the same extractor and output V prime. So then I just ask the question, when can we say that uh, this V uh, is close to uniform given V prime? <coughs> well, this is a simple question. And it turns out that actually there are two cases we can say this thing. So if Z is kind of independent of Z prime, or well maybe if Z has high entropy condition of Z prime, then we can say that this output V is uh, close to uniform given V prime. On that hand, we can also say if Z and Z prime uh, are not uh, are correlated, but W is kind of independent of W prime. Or even if W has high entropy condition in W prime, that same conclusion still holds. <coughs> so it's like if you think of the extractor as uh, symmetric, then uh, basically you can view this as just like a symmetric argument. <coughs> okay. So then how are we going to use this? So basically the first attempt of constructing this merger is that, OK, so we first take a small slice of the first row, and then we, uh, we're going to uh, use it as seed and uh, extract from this w. And then we use this uh, output to extract back from the second row. And then we extract back from w, and then uh, continue doing like So it's uh, essentially like alternating extraction protocol. <coughs> 
And so the argument basically is that whenever you, you hit a good row where this z, uh, the row of z is independent of z prime, you're, go you're going to obtain uh, two outputs which uh, one of them is going to be independent of the other. And in the subsequent rounds, you're going to use, once you have this independence, you're going to keep the independence. This is the sort of uh, the argument. But unfortunately, this simple merger does not quite work because if you look at it, then basically the number of rounds we need to do this kind of alternating instruction is equal to the number of rows. And we start with all the log n over epsilon rows, and each time uh, it's going to need entropy something like all of log n over epsilon. So totally it's going to be all of log n over epsilon again, uh, square again. So again, so, it's, so this gains us nothing. But what we can do is that we can modify it so that we're not going to merge these matrix um, one at one in one step. Instead, we're just going to merge a few rows at each step. So for example, we can merge these two rows um, and merge the second two rows. And then in the next step, we merge these two new rows and then we get the final output. So essentially, you merge t rows in the time. So the point uh, advantage of doing this is that um, you can use the same c to merge these different t rows in each one step. So if you merge t rows at one time, then you take it takes log m over log t steps. And uh, so for some technical reasons, uh, because you have the this uh, you have to consider this modified c. So each time you have to take this like seems to be larger. So so, so if you do the computation, so it, it tells you that the seed is going to need the entropy something like two to the odd of leg, uh, odd of log m over log t times t times log n over epsilon. And then, of course, the the only thing left is to choose uh, t to make this optimal, and then uh, that's a simple computation, and uh, it gives that t you should take t to be log t to be the square root of log m, and that gives you two to this or the law square root of log m times log n over epsilon. And so remember, we start with m equals to all of log n over epsilon. So if you plug that thing, that gives you to do the all of square root of uh, log log n over epsilon times log n over epsilon. Right. Yeah, that's it. So it's basically log uh, n over epsilon 1 plus little over 1. And so there has been some recent progress. So so we are trying to, so again, so this, this 2 to the uh, order of square root of this thing is kind of annoying, so we're trying to get rid of it. And uh, so there's been some recent progress. So uh, Ju has this, this new work, which can get uh, it down to order of log n plus log 1 over epsilon times poly log log 1 over epsilon. And uh, uh, I also have a recent result, which can get order of log n plus log one over sometimes log log one over Maybe, maybe <laughs> you guys should work together. No? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, and I just mentioned that this, uh, uh, also by combining with this new recent uh, two-source extract paper by Am Amon, uh, so it's, it's going to imply a two-source extract with me and should be log n times log log n. Okay. Uh, the, the error is just constant. Uh, this this two source extract outputs one bit with constant error. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just summary. So the, we have this first optimal, almost optimal number of extractor and almost uh, an optimal private amplification protocol for almost all the security parameters. And of course, the open question is that we want to get it down to really optimal constructions where we can get rid of this log log thing, right? So it's it's also kind of annoying. So I want to get it down to like all the log and pl uh, plus log one over epsilon. Um, and uh, so at this time, I'm not sure if the c this, ki this kind of techniques can get it down to all the, uh, to, as uh, to as synthetic or optimal or not. So it's not clear to me at this point. And of course, another interesting question would be to try to find other applications of the techniques. Right, thanks. <laughs>